Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very, very important session. We really want you to watch what we're going to show you and what we're going to speak about, because Adam Wilkes, the CEO and president of AEG Asia, is somebody who has deep, deep knowledge about how you get audiences to feel great and pay money for tickets and experiences and great, great entertainment. Adam, welcome to... Thank you. Uh, all that matters. Just great to have you here again, and uh, it's just very interesting to be able to have this session with you because there's some really interesting things. Plus, you're going to be making a special announcement here during the session today. So, uh, where is uh, we need? There we are. We need some tailoring. Where's Taylor? There we are. Uh, can we go back uh, one, Taylor? There we are. So there we are, Adam. You can see that, and look at that logo, AEG. Very important company, one of the biggest uh, entertainment companies in the world. Let's uh, flip uh, the video, uh, flip the, right, okay. So what are the three main pillars of the AEG business? So AEG's business is based across the intersection of hardware and software, the intersection of content real estate. And we work across music, sports, and venues. Uh, we've been for over 25 years at the forefront of developing the world's greatest uh, music, performance, sports venues, and working with some of the top artists and top sports teams across the world. And it's really all about delivering experiences to fans. And so in terms of delivering experiences to fans, your strategy and the execution of the strategy in Asia really covers many different countries, and we'll speak specifically about them as we go forward. But in terms of music, we'll take a look in just a minute at some of the key artists you've been working with specifically over the most recent period. In terms of sports, there's a whole explosion of sports interest across Asia, which we'll also cover. And then in terms of venues, um, the company rep looks after about 301 uh, different venues across the world. 301 as of today, maybe 302, I don't, I don't know, something okay. like that, yeah. Very good. Okay, so uh, from the music perspective, uh, let's uh, take a look at some of these faces here. People even know their voices just by looking at their yeah, faces. Yeah, these, these are probably a few that, that people recognize. These are some of our, our top artist clients and partners, and we've had the opportunity with all of them um, recently in the last couple of years to tour through Asia. Uh, we just finished earlier this year 14 stadium shows with Ed Sheeran, and we sold over 575,000 tickets. That's in Asia? That's just in Asia, wow. which was part of you know, his incredible world tour, which I think has, has broken every, every record thus far. But in Asia alone, it was no exception, and I think it's the most tickets ever sold by an international artist in this part of the world. Ed Sheeran, so, and the amazing thing about him is when he performs, it's one guy on the stage. It's one guy on the stage, and you know, I think that there's a lot that can be, can be said about Ed, but you know, I think one area that's really benefited him is he's had a, you know, a business philosophy that he's gonna deliver the same experience to fans in Singapore, that he delivers to London, in Jakarta, in New York, and that's in terms of taking the same production across all of the shows, and it's also about ticket pricing. And it's a belief that if you know, fans in the US are paying $80, then fans in Asia should pay $80. You got that, you got that for the ticket prices? It's, a, it's around that range. I mean, it's well. a little bit different by each market, but you do see a lot in Asia where you know, artists in, in the US would stay within a certain price range, and then they right. come to Asia and there's $400 VIP tickets. And I, you know, that's, a, you know, that, that's a tough one to swallow. Why should people in the Philippines pay quadruple what they would pay in the UK? So, right. so Edge had that philosophy. And, I think the results have uh, been pretty, pretty, pretty clear. You, you brought the Rolling Stones to China. Rolling Stones came to China. We toured across Asia and Australia on their uh, 14 and Fire tour. We just had them in North America. Um, just finished up in Miami uh, a few weeks ago. All sold out. Gone clean. Yeah. <laughs> But they, they must make ten to twelve million dollars a show. I mean, those guys are—they're they're incredible. They're—it's um, uh, like a fine wine. They just they keep wine. getting better. You know, as they—they've gotten older, they've. Um, 
maybe they've stopped drinking a little bit. They start hitting more of the notes a little bit more, but they're... <laughs> uh, Mick Jagger's home yeah, so, pumping. Yeah, so the tour actually, the, this tour, Mick Jagger unfortunately had a, a heart condition and the, the tour was postponed. And they started in Chicago in July and he had just come out of heart surgery, and it's like they put like a new titanium heart in there. This guy's running around like a 15-year-old. It's just, Incredible. it's un unbelievable. What a career. Un unbelievable. Okay, let's look at, um, well, Katy Perry. I know yeah. a couple of years ago she did very, very well in you, Indonesia. Mean, yeah, all, all of these artists have come through. Katy Perry, um, you know, we just had Khalid in the region last now, year. That, that's an interesting story because that started kind of club level in this part of the world. When we looked to bring him over, it was a club tour, but his, right. his trajectory was just, you know, shooting upwards. What do you, what do you attribute that to? I think he just has his pulse on, you know, pop music today. It's just the, the guy's writing great songs. Great and, and as we kept looking to schedule the tour, he just kept getting bigger. So right. the, the first run was going to originally be in a thousand cap clubs. And by the time we actually got to confirming it, we moved it into roughly 5,000 cap rooms. And that was just for the, the first teaser run. But right. we're going to have him coming back at some point next year. And he'll probably go from Tokyo to Mumbai. Uh, and I think at this point, it's, you know, 10, 12,000 capacity arenas. So it's just a... Amazing how fast it happens now for, for artists with, with social media. So really, if you look at the trajectory that takes Khalid from effectively a club act into 12,000 seats, obviously dependent upon the music, but you there to support that kind of rise and rise to make sure that it connects. Absolutely, and the key is that he came to Asia on that first cycle. You right. know, traditionally artists uh, would look at this as the last place to tour, and that's just the, the legacy of uh, uh, record sales around the region, and I think there's a, a shift happening. And with uh, streaming now having so much uh, influence over an artist's touring career, and markets around Asia where the populations are so large and the streaming numbers are so large, they're starting to realize that this isn't the last place you should tour. This is arguably maybe the first place you should go to. So interesting with streaming actually stimulating the live business and getting much more of a demand from many countries across the Asia region. Absolutely. Uh, Celine Dion, obviously a staple, a wonderful popularity all over the area. Give us a little... Uh, Celine Dion has been, a, uh, I think, AG's longest uh, artist partner. And she's the first artist to gross over a billion dollars. And that's Hold on a second. To gross what? Billion with a B. U.S. dollars. Billion with a B. And that's on the back of her, her long-standing run in Vegas, which we just finished, and she's uh, embarked on a, on a global tour. Celine Dion is a, is a bit like... I think it's a bit like Metallica. Like, you're either a rabid Celine Dion fan or you're not. But if you're in that community, I mean, people just absolutely love her. We, we had her in Asia last year, and between Asia and Australia and New Zealand, we did 25 shows. Wow. Um, it's just, it's just a, an amazing fan base in this part of the world. Just a great artist with great staying power and someone that, that voice touches women all over the world. Sure does. Okay, uh, Taylor Swift, clearly, um, um, mega, mega name, star, sing, uh, performer, and so forth. Any comments? Yeah, well, she just put out a great album. Great album. And um, I think we're all really excited for her to come back. Right. She's had an incredible success, and she's an artist that's really focused on, on China and has gone a bit deeper oh, than right. other artists, and she's done... Uh, oh you know, big TV endorsement deals there. She's had interactions with uh, Alibaba and set up uh, online stores. They've really, they've done some really interesting things with her in that market. It does pay for an artist to really have that kind of deep dig into developing that kind of linkage into the countries of Asia. Look, if right? you want to be a global artist, you can't skip the part of the world where half the population is. <laughs> it's just, it sounds obvious, but it, Oftentimes, people come here last, or they look at this part of the world as a place that's challenging and, and, and different, and they're right. But that doesn't diminish the importance of, of being here. And you have to look at how do, you, how, do you, how do you do it over here? How do you do it? And it just requires that same time and patience. And right. I think a big part of that is, um, as artists more and more do global deals, how do you make Asia and Australia and New Zealand a greater part of that, of that pie? How do, you, how do you allow them to look at this and say, oh, <laughs> um, how do you allow this to become something that they can look at their annual plans and say, this is where we should be going? 
Okay, so these two individuals here are legends in Australia, but also legends in the broader entertainment area, both very good friends of uh, All That Matters and Music Matters. Uh, the guy on the left is the famous Michael Chug, Chuggy. Who's been here many times. Many times. Know, and, and on the other side, on the right, is the famous Michael Godinsky. So, Michael Godinsky. So we just, Michael Godinsky has been our, our long-term partner in Australia. It was always on a handshake, and, and after about 10 years of that, we sat down over the last year and we formed a partnership and, and AEG made a big investment into Australia, a big investment into Frontier. And Frontier was his company that Frontier you guys Touring acquired. is Michael's company and then Michael Chug then merged into that and we've put right. together uh, an incredible team. These, these two gentlemen are, are true legends in this industry and they are arguably the guys that created the modern day, you know, Australia, New Zealand music industry. Right. And, you know, together with them and with AEG, we're really looking at how do you take this and take Asia and put this together and how do you make this into something that's more integrated, more sophisticated and into a larger part of the, the global puzzle. And the interesting thing about these two guys is that their relationship with talent and the way they can talk to artists is probably unrivaled in terms of even big names uh, and, in fact, we can, let's go to the next slide. Ah, yeah. so you promote all of Elton and this farewell tour, it was a long farewell over 300 concerts, Yeah. maybe more, 350? It just might keep going forever, but... Um, okay, tell <laughs> us about this. So, <laughs> we, um, we've been very fortunate to partner with Elton John and his farewell tour, and it's now toured through much of the world, but we're going to be coming to Australia starting in December, and it's... Uh, I think a testament to two things. First of all, just all that is Elton John. And, and Elton John has always been a, a huge superstar everywhere, but specifically in Australia and New Zealand, he's just always been one of the top artists there. And we worked with Chuggy, his long-term promoter in the market, and kind of built out this strategy. And, and, and it's, uh, this is where I would really give uh, a lot of compliments to to you know, Professor Chug, who's been doing this for so long and, and, and so much to learn from him. We started with 12 shows and we announced them and then it became 24 shows and then it became 36 shows. Wow. We're now at 40 shows. Um, all sold clean, sold, sold out. Sold clean, you know, we're playing all of the markets multiple times. It's like everybody in Australia is going twice. To <laughs> Where is Rother Glen? Is that a place? I have no idea. I mean, honestly, I've been looking at the map. I can't figure out where half these places are. But I'm going to go to all of them, and I'm going to take photos, and I think, I think they're all real. They are real. Geelong, like, what is that? To Geelong? Well, that's where Prince Charles got educated, by the way, a okay. famous, famous school in Geelong. I'm going to bring you with me. Yeah, please do that. <laughs> but uh, this is incredible. And, of course, Elton is the consummate performer, incredible band that have been with him all the years. And just in terms of performance, he's, he's one he's of the greats of all time. He's phenomenal, and it just keeps going. I mean, the, the movie was amazing, and then you know, The Lion King comes out again. Well, of course, that's right. He wrote The Lion King. Uh, and that's actually um, a lot of his fame in Asia came from what? It came from The Lion King. He got reintroduced to a younger audience here on the back of that, and he's quite famous in China because of that. So after we finish in Australia and New Zealand, we're gonna take the yellow brick road up north and, and come through this part of, the, part of the world. And he's been to China before? It's been a few times, yeah. Right. And great uh, management team, great staging team, and of course with AEG, everything is really taken care of. Incredible. 40 da 42 dates? 40 dates in Australia? It's 40 dates so far. Who knows? Maybe there's some other towns that we haven't found yet we could, we could add on. Okay, so here's one of the pillars of what you do, and tell us about the whole sports uh, involvement of AEG. So, uh, as a global company, uh, sports is a big pillar of our business. You know, we're co-owners of the Los Angeles Lakers. We own the uh, Los Angeles Kings, the hockey team. Ice hockey. Ice hockey. We uh, own the Galaxy, the, the soccer team that David Beckham used to play David Beckham and now and Ibrahim. Stanton is now our star player who's now scored the most goals ever in, in MLS history. So we've always been looking at how do we have a larger presence in sports in Asia. So over, over many years, we've had an incredible partnership with the NBA. And the NBA is absolutely- That's the National Basketball Association of America. Yes, and the NBA has built an incredible global brand. And in China, I think hands down, they are the biggest international entertainment brand that's, that's ever come into the market. That's almost viewed more than just a sport. It's kind of like a lifestyle activity. Lifestyle, it's culture. And you, know, you, you, you talk to, you get in the taxi in the morning, 
and the taxi driver knows all the stats of the game from the night before. They know all the players, and some of that's attributed to, to Yao Ming, but it's not just that. It's really just, it's, it's become part of the, the national dialogue. So we, we've worked with the NBA for years. Uh, this year we have the Lakers coming in uh, with the Nets. We're also doing the first ever NBA game in Mumbai on October 4th and 5th. Wow. This is a real, a real historic event. Um, and more recently, we've, we've moved into the football space, and we've partnered with Relevant Sports on their ICC uh, tournament. Uh, we did two games in Singapore a couple months ago, and then also Shanghai and Shenzhen. And we're looking at how we could build out that property across multiple markets around Asia. So we've got the Manchester United and Inter, the Inter Italian Milan. side. Yeah. Um, but we discovered that in Singapore, everybody's a Manchester United fan. Everybody had a red shirt on. There was not one Italian in the audience. How many of you have Manchester United fans in this audience? I mean, got one. Oh, good, we're safe. So you gotta ask how many people are Singaporeans. It's probably just those two people over there. Yeah, how many people are Singaporeans? That's a good question. <laughs> a good, good, good point. Okay. Um, but also, we've got, you know, uh, across our business in Asia and our, our marquee venue in Shanghai, we just hosted the Dota 2 tournament, which is, it, it's like the World Cup of esports. It had the largest purse in the history of esports. And how much was that? $34 million. So that's US bigger dollars. than the Fortnite prize money of $30 million? I think so. And it was, and it was done by crowdsourcing, which is just like, how cool is that? Crowdsourcing yeah. to, to for raise the, the prize For the money? purse, yeah. Um, we, we hosted the first ever USC fight in Shanghai a couple of years ago. They just were in Shenzhen a few days ago. Um, the so, NHL hockey was... Uh, so Dota 2 was held where? It was in Shanghai at the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Which, which is, is one of your buildings. It's co-owned by AG, and they did five nights there. It's about 18,000 tickets per night, and I think it's sold out in you know, two minutes or something like that. It's a, What's your view on the future of esports as an entertainment, cultural, lifestyle I, I mean, it, it, it's just huge, and I, I think that's been a big focus of the, the conference this week. Um, I think when you look at sports properties in Asia, and you're talking about NBA and, 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 um, and different football leagues, there's a space for them to be here, but the, most of those are exhibition games. When you look at esports, I think that with what just happened in Shanghai, it proves that the, the largest esports events in the world can be taking place in Shanghai, in parts of Asia, just like they could be taking place in the US or Europe. And I think that's really significant. And you also introduced the first Chinese fighter into UFC. Yeah, um, on the, on the, that, that was not us, that was the oh. UFC themselves. But right. I think just a couple days ago, the first uh, Chinese fighter, female fighter, uh, won in Shenzhen. Wow. So that could become like the, you know, the Yao Ming of, uh, of UFC. It's always about trying to localize these properties. And I think that's what One FC has done a great job with is how do you take MMA, but how do you make it more uh, uh, palatable for a local audience? Right. So in terms of venues and in terms of infrastructure and how one does things, I mean, when you look at all of the venues, certainly in the United States and in Europe, uh, the biggest venue, the most successful venue in entertainment, which is in London, the O2, very well known, Staples uh, in uh, Los Angeles, Berlin, and now trying to look at how you can take that AEG process, the incredible teams that you have, how do you look at Asia? What's your view on Asia? I mean, you've got to take a step back. We, we believe that it's all about the entertainment experience. Right. And that is from when the fan buys a ticket to when they go home at night. That entire process, that's the experience. Right. And if you look at these projects here, you know, on the, on the right is the Staples Center, part of LA Live, O2, Las Vegas, T-Mobile Arena. O2 is the one on the right, and Staples is the one on the left. Uh, yes. And these were projects that redefined an entire city. You know, with Los Angeles, 25 years ago, uh, our company looked at downtown LA, which was, it was the bad part of town. Very bad. It, it, was, it was the place you didn't go to. And we bought hundreds of acres of land, and we put an arena right smack in the middle. And then we bought the Lakers, and we bought the Kings, and put them in there. We created a company, which is now called AEG Presents, and we started promoting some of the biggest concerts in the world. And around that, we then built a district. A district. A district. A district. And it, so it, it's, you've got the main arena, but there's a whole entertainment district that surrounds it. There is restaurants, there is shops, there's bars, there's an hotels. Uh, there's a thousand key Marriott hotel, there's a condominiums, there's a convention center. And this all built out over many years. And this became an incredible destination, a place to go where you, you don't just go to the show and get and leave. You go there, you hang out, you have an experience. And over many years, and, and for those of you from Los 
Los Angeles or that travel there, downtown LA is the cool part of town. Very. Downtown LA is where all the restaurants are, right. all the good bars are, there's great condominiums, and it really, really redefined how people look at the landscape of Los the Angeles. You could say the same thing about the O2 in London. This was a, a white elephant. This was called the Millennium Dome. It was a project that the government initiated with no real a clear plan about how to commercialize it afterwards. And, um, you know, we went over there, you know, the gringos came waving the American flag with this crazy idea. And I think people at the time thought it made no sense. How could you make that work? And, and since it's open, the O2 has been the most profitable and the most attended venue in the entire world. And that's without an anchor team. There's no, there's no basketball in there. There's no hockey in there. It's just pure one-off events, music. And, and, it, and it's taken that area of London. I mean, you're, you're from, you live in London, right? I mean, people didn't used to go over there. You would never know. go over there. No. And now it's a place that people go there every Absolute week. Absolute mecca, not just for entertainment, but as you say, it's a lifestyle experience. You go there to really have an incredible uh, overall uh, night out or day out and so forth. Let's go to the next slide. So when we, when we looked at Asia, you know, there, there's, there's so much opportunity out here. And we're all in this room because we're, we're believers in that. Right. Um, but at AEG, we also feel that, you know, the opportunity needs infrastructure. You can't make things work unless you have roads and airports and ports. So in our business, what do we need to make everything come together? And what we see over and over again is that when we tour these artists around the region, there's just a lack of the right infrastructure. And so you when can, you say talk about the region, you look at Bangkok, give us some other, the, the, so, the so, region, what's I mean, the region? The region for us is, you know, the, the plate that we work off of is Tokyo to Mumbai, Beijing to, to Auckland. It's, right. it's, a big, it's a big place. Big size. But talking more specifically about, about Asia, and we've seen this in Shanghai, we see this in Singapore, Jakarta, right. Bangkok as, as listed here. These are markets where there's a, a, a vibrant audience and there's an audience that has a real demand and desire for live entertainment. But most of the venues were built 20, 30 years ago. Right. Most of them were purpose built for volleyball, bad, badminton, ping pong, basically not for music, not for modern events. They don't have the amenities, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the production facilities. So from a fan perspective, you know, we do so many concerts in Bangkok it takes people two hours to get to the venue. Oh, the traffic in Bangkok. It takes two hours to go back from the venue. So sure. we start saying, okay, if we sold 10,000 tickets to go see Shawn Mendes, and it's taking six hours of your time to do this, right. like, what if it was a nicer venue in the center of the city? Maybe he would have sold 20,000 tickets. And, and that's really where it comes. There, there is a artificial ceiling in markets around Asia because the infrastructure is not there. Right. And with the right infrastructure, a whole new world opens up. And we, we saw that in Shanghai when we opened the Mercedes-Benz Arena. And just like Bangkok, just like Singapore, there was an older legacy building that had been built decades earlier. And it was government run, poorly managed, not really commercially focused. And they were doing something like 40, 45 events a year. <laughs> And we figured if we're going to build this new venue, if we do 45 events a year, then we've cornered the market, you know, success. <laughs> and we then, you know, we opened our venue and we did 75 events and they still did 45. And it just meant that the market can support so much more. So let's have a look at the, what it looks like inside one of these. Uh... So, so this is a new, a new Bangkok venue. We've partnered with a company called The Mall Group. The Mall Group is one of the leading retail developers in Thailand. Um, they're the company that was first to the market to bring in a lot of the luxury brands. And we've had this great partnership where they're looking at where the retail industry is going, where retail is shifting online. And how do you then create these mixed use developments as captive districts if it's not just about shopping for clothing? Right. So they're going into lifestyle developments. They're going more focused on F&B and nightlife and entertainment. And that's the trend of retail, right? That's the trend of retail. So we've looked at that and we said, how do we take an LA Live or an O2, how do we do that in a densely populated place like Bangkok? Right. So we went, we went vertical. You basically, you see... A vertical district. Vertical district. So right here is what's going to be called um, uh, Hemisphere. This is right, if, so for those of you familiar with Bangkok, it's right off of Sukhumvit. It's directly connected to the BTS, and it's right next to the Emporium. So it becomes an integrated district, and you enter, and you basically have multiple floors of F&B, bars, nightclubs, and on the top is, is our venue. And, you know, I think that... For Bangkok, this is going to really redefine the market. Fantastic. And I think that as we look at other places like 
our neighbors here, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, this is what's lacking in these markets. Absolutely correct. Uh, let's go to that. Okay, so now what's this? So we just, uh, a couple months ago, announced a partnership with CJ Group. And so this is Seoul, this South is, Korea, this is and this Seoul. is a new announcement which we wanted to make here. Well, no, this, this is this actually, this one came out already. Okay. Right? <laughs> but, um, but for here. No, what I'm saying is we're making this announcement for we've people never, who are not aware of it. We've this. never told you fine folks about it. So right. um, we've partnered with the CJ Group, which is an incredible company that works off across all areas of media and entertainment in South Korea. And they truly dominate what I would call the K-culture space. They're in music, they're in film, they're in fashion, they're in cosmetics, they're in food. And together we're building a district in Greater Seoul and it's gonna you know, really have many aspects like, like LA Live and it's gonna be anchored by uh, a new arena which uh, on the next slide you'll, you'll see a, an initial rendering. So that's the rendering of the arena. So you know, in Seoul you have an incredible market where it's 25 million people, it's one of the highest per cap GDPs in the world, very affluent place, a, a huge, huge content industry which is thriving there and of course internationally. But most of the entertainment real estate is anchored around the 1988 Olympics, which was a wonderful event a long time ago. It was 31 years ago. And those venues were not built for the modern day industry. So, so together with CJ, we have this vision to, to create, this is gonna essentially be the O2 of Asia. And it's 20,000 capacity venue. It's also gonna have a large outdoor space so you could have outdoor shows, indoor shows, connect them together, and then integrate it into a larger uh, mixed use development. And this is really gonna be something that's gonna redefine that market. So in the market at the moment, there isn't a venue that would have this kind of contemporary capability, facilities, and would allow you to really bring in anything, sport, and the, the pillars of age. Yeah, there's, there's nothing like that now. And I think that you know, what we're gonna see in a market that's already thriving for content, the content needs a home. It right. needs the right infrastructure to be based around. But this is also a bet that you're making that'll last 20, 30, 40 years, because once you build it, they will come. Yeah, and that's, look, I think that's a, that's a good point, and that's, that's where AEG is positioning ourselves in this market. We, we are big believers in Asia. We see this as absolutely the future for our company and for our industry. And we're, while we're active in concert tours and sports events, these investments are, are multi-hundred million dollar investments that anchor us into markets for decades to come. We are gonna be in Bangkok for a long time. We are gonna be in South Korea for a long time. We have been and will continue to be in China for a long time. What about Indonesia? M biggest population outside of China and India. We're looking, we're looking. looking. If anybody has any ideas, let me know. We, okay, we, we, and we, India? Yes. Same thing. Also, this, look, there, there's, there's a lot out there. You know, we're going step by step. Our, our, our business is, you know, we're a privately held company and we, you know, we look at the right opportunities. We want to be in the right cities, on the right locations in the right cities with the right partners. And when those interests converge, we're ready to do a deal. So, you know, recently we, we merged with SMG, which is one of the leading um, um, facility management companies. We f facility management means managing a venue managing all aspects of the logistics, everything. Exactly. So there's venues that we own as real estate developers, and we manage those, and there's venues that we manage as a management company. So we had a subsidiary called AEG Facilities, and SMG merged together to create ASM, which now has over 300 venues around the world, which includes uh, the, the soon-to-be-developed Kitech Stadium in, in Hong Kong, which will be part of the portfolio. So um, I think on the next slide we have... This is just some of our, our, our presence around the region. So this is a, just a little bit of a visual on the cities where we have venues, the cities that we manage venues. Um, we're in 13 countries with 19 venues today. And just over the last four years, several years, we've, we've toured artists into 45 cities across Asia and Australia. Well, that's, un, that's, that's something that hasn't uh, been achieved on this kind of scale. Well, I, and you've got, I see that you have... Uh, some of that's attributed to Elton John going to places we never heard of, so I have to give him some credit. And <laughs> but in, in China, where you're looking at uh, 4, 8, 12, 15 different cities in China? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of cities in China. And, and um, we, you know, whenever we have the opportunity, we, we want to work with artists that want to go deeper in these markets. Right. And... Um, 
the same is to be said for India, which I think we're only just starting to explore. There, there is an opportunity for artists to go to so many places across this region. Right. And if you want to be truly in the global business, these are where the fans are. And again, look back at the streaming numbers, and these are where your fans are. So the notion of streaming that stimulates a whole wider interest, interest in new music, new artists, new entertainment experiences, that in a sense is one of the factors that is leading you to make these big bets, big investments that you can then go in and basically help really shape the market. I, I think it's all happening around the same time. I mean, uh, I believe that what we're doing now couldn't have happened 15 years ago, 10 years ago, or even right. five years ago. It's, it's, a, it's a convergence of the economics of these markets and with technology and with music coming together. It's a really exciting times to be, uh, to be out here. And exciting times to be a promoter and exciting time to also be able to work closely with talent, with music companies, with streaming companies, with social media companies, social music companies, that all can then make sure that you develop a worldwide audience that if you really hit, like for example, some of the big K-pop acts, uh, there's certainly Absolutely. money in life. Absolutely. And, our, and our little announcement today is that we've actually uh, just relocated our Asia headquarters to this, this fine shop house here. So if anybody- Singapore, give them the a hand. Crowd, They're coming to Singapore. This is where it's going to be. <laughs> so this is going to be your headquarters here yeah, at Road. So just as we've had, you know, having an office in, in, in Tokyo, opening soon in Seoul, Shanghai, Bangkok, across Australia, New Zealand, we, we decided where's home going to be? And we looked at where the middle was, and Singapore really is the, the logical choice. And uh, I've just moved here two months ago. Uh, we're, we've got a new team coming on board, and it's, uh, it's very exciting times, and we've just rented this lovely building, so we're really, really excited to be here. Good. Well, I can, I can almost picture you in, uh, behind one of those windows there, <laughs> plotting how you can get thousands of people in your new venues plotting, and new plotting. entertainment <laughs> districts. <laughs> Well, Thank you. so ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for what you've just heard? This is really big vision, but it's also really anchored by great knowledge, great experience, great professionalism, and led by somebody like yourself that you know where and what to do to really make Thank entertainment and entertainment stick. So Adam, thanks so much Thank for coming so much. here. Really All that matters, Adam you. Wilkes. A real special, special guy. <laughs> Adam, thank you. Thanks.